I believe the fifth in our Diplomat webinar series, which will be focusing, as you all know, on the tumultuous events that are currently unfolding in Myanmar. Unless you've been living under a rock or have been on a silent meditation retreat for the last month, you'll know that the military took power in Myanmar on February the 1st, arresting leading politicians, including State Councillor Aung San Suu Kyi, and essentially canceling her party's massive victory at elections that were held in November. This unexpected move has thrown the country's politics into turmoil. Hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people have taken to the streets to protest the new coup government. Um, and, you know, these protests are also taking place against a backdrop of racial and religious tensions and divisions that have run through Myanmar's modern history, as well as active conflicts in outlying parts of the country. We're very privileged to be joined today by a distinguished panel of guests to discuss the coup, its aftermath, and its longer term ramifications. Beaming in from Washington, D.C. is Yun Sun, who heads the East Asia program at the Stimson Center in Washington, D.C. Among many other things, Yun is among the world's leading experts on contemporary China-Myanmar relations and has conducted extensive research into the tangled and complex relationship between the Chinese government, Chinese business interests, and the ethnic armed groups that lie along the China-Myanmar border. We're also joined by Jared McCarthy, a postdoctoral researcher based at the National University in Singapore, of Singapore, who studies state society relations in Myanmar, particularly the relationship between conflict and market reform. Um, and recently, Jared wrote a fascinating piece um, on the NLD's economic policy, in particular, the curious absence of any class dimension to its vision for Myanmar's eco economic development. Um, and so I think he's well placed to, be, to discuss some of the economic underpinnings of the current challenges that the country faces. Um, as our third panelist, we were initially going to be joined by the journalist Nin Yarana Zaw from Yangon, who would have um, you know, we've been able to sort of talk us through the increasingly tense situation on the streets. Unfortunately, she had to pull out at the last minute, but we're very lucky to be hearing instead from Tintin Yo, a veteran activist based in Thailand, um, who's been working for many years um, in the political space in Myanmar. Tintin Yo is an advisor to and former chairperson of the Burmese Women's Union, an organization that was founded in 1995 with the aim of promoting the involvement of, win of women in Myanmar's politics um, across social, economic, and ethnic lines. She's also the managing director of Burma News International, a network comprised of 16 independent ethnic and local media groups in Myanmar. And both of these organizations have taken part and been involved in various ways in the civil dis disobedience movement that it's emerged since the coup. And so, you know, um, Tintinyo should be able to give us a sense of the challenges that Burmese civil society is facing and how they're seeking to adapt to it and oppose this sudden lurch back into military rule. Uh, one more thing before we get started, I want to alert all of you to a new report um, that um, Diplomatic Risk, uh, Diplomat Risk Intelligence, our political risk unit, has just published um, on the situation in Myanmar since the coup of February the 1st. Featuring articles from leading authorities on Myanmar, the report offers a comprehensive assessment of where the country is a month after the coup and where it might be heading in the weeks and months to come. Anyone interested in reading the report and subscribing to DRI um, can visit dri.thediplomat.com. That's dri.thediplomat.com. Um, and just one note on format before we get started, I will be inviting each of the speakers to talk for about 10 minutes about um, various aspects of the political crisis that's unfolding in Myanmar. And then after that, I might pose a question or two of my own to the panel to prompt some discussion before we move on to the question and answer session. If you have any questions for the panelists, please feel free to enter them in the chat box um, within the Zoom uh, uh, software program. And then I'll, I'll read off a selection of these to the um, panelists during the Q&A period. And so without further ado, um, you know, I, I'll call on our speakers to deliver their, their comments. I, I think I'll start with Tintin Yeo, who's you know, to give us a bit of an overview of, you know, um, how local activist groups, you know, have viewed these changes, how they're adapting to them, and, and what strategies they're adapting, uh, adopting to, you know, to 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 fight Myanmar's return to military rule. Um, Tintin Yeo. Thank you so much um, uh, for giving me this chance to talk about the situation in Burma, and also like uh, everyone who are listening and uh, who have interest on 
our situation. For us, it's like, um, yeah, it's been a month and then um, we all assume that this uh, struggle will not end any sooner, although we very much expect that it will, it will, be, uh, it will end soon. Uh, after uh, and also like um, we we can see that um, day by days the um, the responses from the military regime become very intense intense and also become very brutal and also like really aggressive. So um, twenty eight last Sunday was the worst uh, scenarios, but after that it followed loss of arrest, especially like uh, the arrest. Um, come night time, the time that when people sleep. So just uh, last night also, um, one of the um, journalists from Demo uh, the DBV, which is well-known media groups, um, as he was like a, uh, aggressively arrested. So, the, and also like um, <clears throat> until now, it has been more than 1000 people has been arrested and many of them are not known where they are kept and also um, and how they are being treated. It is the, the situation become like um, really um, a dark, the darkness time, like where we used to be, it used to be like a, after 88 uprising. You know, everyone have to live with fear, anxieties, and also angers. And also like uh, why um, this situation come back again in 2021. And also like, uh, we know that the world is watching, but under the, under the eyes of the world, our people are brutally killed. So like uh, on 28, it's uh, estimated like um, in, in the news, it confirmed that about 18 people are killed, but there, um, there can be more. So some also, some media also said that, local media said that it is more than 20 people has been killed. And then also like uh, many women are included too. And among them is about, until now in one month, there has been like about five women who has been killed. And two of them are like an elderly woman. And then uh, one of them who just got shot uh, in the evening of the 28th was just a single mother. And she was just went, uh, went out to buy medicine and then she got shot from fireplace. So that means that the security forces are definitely using sniper shooting the civilians. She is not even like uh, involved in the pro protest. So she is just a, a normal, ordinary woman who just went out to buy medicine, but she got shot. So, um, I mean, like uh, the country uh, have security forces to protect external and internal um, threat especially extended threat for the military. But now they are the ones that who are killing the people and also like at the, everyone, uh, not only killing, not only like, uh, you know, torturing, but also looting. You know, yesterday it was like in the, the, the Nintari division, like in Baik, in Mie, you know, they just broke into the house and they just took everything that is like uh, including money and all other properties. So, um, and also like at this times, um, they even like a destroying people properties, like a motorbike, car, not only uh, crack down the peaceful demonstrators, but they are destroying everything. They're just trying to um, rule the country with fear, trying to scare the people in every possible way they can. And at this time, we assume that um, they are targeting more and more to the journalists and media houses. Because um, in this month, or in one month after the coup, uh, journalists uh, and the media groups, many media groups, aside from the two media that is working under the uh, uh, under the military regime, the rest they stand with the people, and they has been like a, a playing a very important role in uh, informing the whole country and also the world, what is happening on the ground and how people are being treated under the military regime. So uh, now they target to the journalists. It has been like uh, more than five people uh, around town, I think. Uh, we cannot confirm the other yet, be arrested. 
uh, from the media groups, including some female journalists. One of the journalists was beaten brutally, arrest, arrested. So they don't they don't treat you know journalists even with one uh, how to say uh, sincerity or like a respect. And also we we assume that they were targeted to the uh, uh, civil society organizations, including women organization. In this time, they have already ordered uh, about seventeen. Uh, workers, labor-related organization to to not operate anymore. So they especially target to the organization those are not registered in this time. Uh, so uh, my organization, Bamis Women Union, also not registered organization because like uh, we were not able to register in the past years uh, because of our nature of work. And then now um, many of them are very actively involved in the uh, in the movement, I mean, like in the movement against the military regime, and also like uh, they have been active um, communicating and helping with some of the um, civil disobedience, um, uh, how to say, um, people, the, the civil servants who side with the civil dis disobedience movement. So I, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, worried that there are many organizations who are working like that, and many activists who are really like a, 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 how to say publicly uh, against him, the military dictatorship. So, so now later they will be targeted. So that like uh, there will be more bloodshed and more arrest. Um, so if this continues, uh, you know, our future will be really in darkness. So I'm so worried and that we are trying every, every possibility to get rid of the military regime, including demonstrating peacefully and also like, um, uh, messaging and then also like helping the people so every possible ways um, you know all the groups are trying to help each other but we don't know how long it will it will take so that like and also we will, we will really want to see that the international community including UN take action more than uh, how to say releasing statements and also talking about the concern but there should be some action to stop the bloodshed in our country. Thanks, Tintinio. Um, okay, um, I might move on to uh, Jared now. I, I wanted to. I wondered if you might address the, you know, the question of, you know, why this has happened in Myanmar at this current point. Um, you know, the civil disobedience movement, the protests against the coup, have brought the country to a standstill and show no signs of slackening off. Um, and and the generals have, you know, in many ways thrown out or compromised the very fragile. Um, power sharing arrangement that's that they had under the previous NLD government under the current constitution, which seemed to be um, holding up fairly well and safeguarding their interests and preserving their um, freedom from civilian scrutiny. Why, you know, why do you think they chose to do something like this at this current juncture, something that seems so to run so counter to their rational interests? Yeah, thank, thank you, Sebastian, and, and, and thank you to the diplomat for, for bringing this together um, today. Um, I just I want to thank uh, Titinho for, I think, framing out uh, the severity of the situation in, in Myanmar. And, and also, I think, just to note the extraordinary tragedy um, of the loss of life that we've had uh, in, in recent days in particular. Um, but since February 1st, um, this is, it's just heartbreaking. And... Um, you know, I just want to stand in solidarity with everyone in Myanmar who's um, fighting for the future and, and continuing to, to fight the good fight. Um, I want to say it's sad that, that we can't be joined by anyone from Myanmar, um, uh, physically in Myanmar right now because of the internet lockdowns that are being held every night between 11 p.m. and 9 a.m., which makes it impossible. Um, this seminar started at 7.30 a.m. Uh, Yangon time. I was inundated with messages from people in Myanmar who wanted to join uh, and couldn't because of the internet lockdown. So I just, I just want to note that and, and, you know, let people be reminded that that's, that's what's happening every night and we can't normalise it. It's, it's pretty uh, insane what's happening. Um, I, I suppose I want to start off just saying that we're in the midst of a pivotal moment. Um, this is a mass uprising for democracy against not just dictatorship, but against this model of hybrid democracy that the military had entrenched since 2008. Um, we're seeing a widespread uprising, a widespread civil disobedience movement, um, the emergence of effectively a parallel government 
of contested sovereignty between uh, parliamentarians who were elected in November last year, who took the oath of office and have now formed a committee representing the Pirang Sukhluto, the Union Parliament, um, and you know even entire cities in Myanmar who are declaring themselves to be affiliated with the democratically elected government, uh, and a number of, of quite significant and high-profile defections by Myanmar government officials. Um, the Myanmar ambassador to the UN defected on the weekend to join and affiliate with the democratic movement. Uh, you know, individual police officers and in some, in some towns, entire police departments defecting and joining the protesters. And uh, just yesterday, a special branch police major in Yangon who uh, also uh, live streamed his defection and encouraged uh, his colleagues to, to join. Um, we are in the midst of a pivotal moment uh, and trapped in uh, what I would describe as a cycle of suffering, uh, of uh, uprising uh, against the, uh, the coup and subsequent crackdown. And uh, this cycle is going to continue um, uh, you know, based on all the conversations I've had with Myanmar activists until there is some uh, improvement and resolution uh, where the grievances and demands of protesters uh, are heard and, and that there is a return to, to democracy. This isn't going to go away, it's just going to uh, continue to worsen and we're going to be stuck in this cycle because of the actions of the military. So how did we get here? Um, I think it's important to note that, um, you know, many of us were surprised that the military took this move. Um, uh, this system of sort of hybrid civilian military rule, which the military had entrenched since 2008, seemed to work so much in the interests of the military between 2010 and uh, 2020. The military had total command autonomy, 25% of seats in parliament for military MPs uh, who were unelected. Um, most civilians, uh, elected civilians at least, accepted the partial democratic system, uh, uh, which the military had designed as part of the 2008 constitution. Uh, and Suu Kyi, you know, Aung San Suu Kyi personally defended the military from uh, you know, allegations of, of war crimes. Uh, and, you know, the military's businesses, businesses um, uh, which were already very strong, uh, having flourished during the 1990s and, and 2000s, were able to flourish with new flows of foreign investment and joint ventures and a level of national and, you know, business level integration to the global economy, which arguably has been unseen in, in the country's history. I, I think that perhaps what wasn't grasped fully was that the um, military's uh, ideal of disciplined democracy, which was this kind of concept that the military had put forward in, in the 1990s when it had announced this roadmap to sort of disciplined flourishing uh, democracy, um, that central to this idea um, uh, was not just 25% of seats in parliament and you know, command autonomy and impunity, um, but was also this idea that senior ranking officers we, could take up Sort of respectable positions in uh, you know administration and, and governance as ministers, speakers of parliament, vice president, president, on a semi semi regular basis, um, and you know this would allow for kind of a generation of the top tier of the military uh, uh, to retire from active duty, uh, if not every five years, every ten years perhaps, in the same way, for example, that leaders of the Thane Sein era administration retired from the Tupperdor. You know, General Thane Sein, uh, uh, Ushui Man, uh, 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 Kino Min, uh, others who retired from the military into positions in the Thane Sein administration. And that this idea of circulation from military into sort of civilian quote unquote governance um, seems to have been a major part of how disciplined democracy was imagined uh, as, as how it should function by uh, the military. Um, and, you know, of course, this means that the, that the military uh, was both envisioned as the umpire of this disciplined democracy, but also a key player within this sort of hybrid democratic system. But there were two kind of big potholes um, uh, in this sort of stage of Myanmar's roadmap to disciplined flourishing democracy, as they called it, which they didn't really account for. The first was their vanity. Um, that they thought, you know, they were popular because they thought they had done a good job and that they could campaign 
and effectively build a base which could win uh, a sizable chunk of the vote and therefore uh, win a sizable chunk of seats in parliament. Um, and so the, the second uh, sort of uh, major pothole here was uh, that they chose the wrong electoral system to protect their interests. So I'll just talk quickly about the first um, uh, point. The military thought had done a very good job bringing order to the country in the 1990s and 2000s, following the collapse of, of socialism uh, and the, uh, the, the socialist dictatorship, uh, and then in kind of leading this transition to semi-market uh, sort of uh, uh, economy during the 1990s and 2000s. So they thought they'd done a good job during that period. And then especially during the same period, there was intense competition within the USDP as to who could lead and drive the liberalization and reform process. This is a key basis on which they ran for election, uh, uh, re-election in 2015. So there was this sense of arrogance because you, know, you often get this in autocratic regimes, they were sheltered from the realities of criticism from their constituents um, uh, because people, if they ever gave them a direct and full uh, uh, critique of uh, military dictatorship would be imprisoned and locked up. And so people presented as if they you know, may have complied with this regime, but as soon as new alternatives began to emerge uh, and a new future began, began to become imaginable, uh, that, that, collapse, that, that support collapsed. So there was a sense of arrogance coupled with the fear they imposed on citizenry through violence and brutality it meant they didn't quite understand how toxic the military and the USDP were in the eyes of most Burmese people. As a result, they mistakenly thought they would do well electorally head to head against Aung San Suu Kyi's National League for Democracy in most areas of the country. Uh, they probably accepted in 2015 that they would not win the elections in 2015. Um, but given that the uh, constitution only requires the Union Solidarity and Development Party, the military's proxy party, to win 26% of seats in parliament to form a majority uh, hand in hand with the 25% of uh, military MPs in parliament, the architects of the 2008 constitution probably felt that odds on they would be able to scrape through to form government, if not every election, then regularly enough that there would be circulation of the top tiers of the military into civilian administration. And you, would, you wouldn't have this sort of top heavy situation where you've got senior ranks of the military who are getting older and now have nowhere to go. Uh, and of course, this is the dynamic that's played out in relation to Senior Commander uh, Min Online, who uh, was due to retire five years ago. His term was extended by five years. He was due, turns 65 uh, this year. Uh, and uh, you know, this reality that the system just was not functioning in the way that they uh, envisaged um, was one of the key reasons why uh, you know, this, this, this coup has been brought on at this particular moment. Um, I want to note that in, in 2015, the USDP did uh, indeed get a sizable chunk of the vote, less than they may have hoped, um, but a respectable showing of 28% of the national vote share. Um, so that's not, an, they're not politically irrelevant in terms of the vote share. But this leads to the second issue and the second blunder that they made, which is that uh, as autocrats, uh, uh, and especially sort of sheltered autocrats, they were ignorant of how different electoral systems function and produce different kinds of electoral outcomes. Uh, as a result, the first past the post electoral system that the military chose for Myanmar's elections um, benefits large popular parties that win a majority of the vote across constituencies. It's a pretty simple system that's consistent with the idea of, of sort of majority rules, uh, which is sort of one way in which we kind of define or, or democracy can be defined. Um, but in practice, in this system, parties that have a solid rusted on voter base of, say, 20 to 30% generally struggle uh, to win seats in parliament up against large populist parties. And this is what we've seen in 2015 and in 2020 with the USDP. So as I said, they got 28% of the national vote share in 2015, uh, which uh, would have been enough for them to govern with the military if these votes had translated into seats in parliament. But because the NLD won the largest share of the vote, uh, 40 to 60% or uh, more in most seats, the USDP only took seats where it won the largest share of the vote, i.e. that it beat the NLD. And this was in only 8% of seats. Inversely, the NLD got a seat bonus in 2015 
57% of the vote share converted into almost 80% of seats in parliament. 2020 saw a similar dynamic with the NLD winning 85% of seats for around 65% or so of the vote. So this electoral system that the military it itself chose was locking in NLD victories in perpetuity and entrenching the political irrelevance of the USDP and therefore threatening the idea of disciplined democracy as the military had envisaged it, that senior members of the military could retire into civilian administration uh, when the USDP didn't win elections in their own right, they could uh, govern in coalition. Uh, I want to just intriguingly note that the USDP parliament actually debated whether to adopt an alternate electoral system, proportional representation, in 2014, ahead of the 2015 elections. At that time, they believed they would do well at the 2015 elections uh, because of what I already noted about the vanity and uh, self-belief that they had. But they also expressed uh, uh, the idea at this time that the country was not ready for a proportional representation system, that they needed big parties like the union, like the USDP and the NLD to develop and compete before a democratic system uh, then handed power to smaller parties with more micro visions for the country. And this is especially the way that they thought about ethnic parties. Um, of course, the USDP itself became a minor party uh, because it only won 8% of seats in parliament in 2015 uh, and even less uh, in, in the 20, after the 2020 elections. So it had the opportunity to change the electoral system in 2014, but chose not to. And uh, as a result, they no longer have had the parliamentary majority since, since 2016 to push through reforms of any kind, not to mention proportional representation. So the decision to stage a coup, I think, was based on the idea that they could intervene to redesign electoral politics in a sort of Thai-style coup, seizing power for a period with the military allying themselves with uh, conservative and economic elites to perform sort of surgery on the political system and ensure it worked in all their interests. Uh, the reason why I think this is uh, their main objective uh, is because the first group that they approached to join the State Administrative Council were minor parties and ethnic parties which struggled to win election head to head against the NLD in the first past the post electoral system. These were the first parties that the, that the uh, military courted and asked to join the State, State Administrative uh, Council, uh, evidently promising them you will do better in a future democratic system that we design because uh, you know, we will put in some kind of system, for example, proportional representation to benefit their interests. Of course, the military coup has demonstrated that support for democracy and for elections is far bigger than the massive, already massive support that the military, that the NLD has. The democracy is far more pop popular even than Aung San Suu Kyi. So they've managed to anger the military through their coup not just the 65% or so of the electorate who voted for the NLD, but many others who see the coup as a return to the dark days of dictatorship, stagnation, isolation, and brutality that characterized the 1990s and 2000s. In light of the murder of dozens of protesters over the weekend and since the 1st of February, and the disappearance of hundreds uh, more by security forces around Myanmar uh, in recent weeks, the fear that the coup means a return to brutal dictatorship is well-founded. Uh, the obvious fact now is that the military gravely misjudged how much the country has changed since 1988 and how willing and equipped people are to fight for a better future for themselves and for their children. The entire 2008, con 2008 constitution and this roadmap to disciplined democracy is being contested including demands for a democratic federation and a defanging of the military and its right to intervene into politics at all. As one of my close interlocutors said to me recently, the military thought that they laid a trap for a mouse, but instead they have caught a tiger. It is unclear how much and how long it will take for the military to realize 
then it cannot govern a country where much of upland and lowland areas are in open rebellion against it. What is clear is that the Myanmar of 2021 is unlike 1988. There is a far larger middle class, a better connected citizenry, and more techn technologically savvy people than there have ever been in Myanmar's history. But all of these are backed by strong networks of horizontal reciprocity and community solidarity created to survive the dark days of dictatorship and autocratic austerity when the government did very little for anyone in a social sense. It is these groups at neighborhood, ward and village level across the country who are now mobilizing massively to support protesters, to feed and house striking workers who are immobilizing the apparatus of government and banking, who are leading the struggle for democracy. In a sense, the dictatorship sowed the seeds of its own protest movement, which will endure and carry on in perpetuity until there is a resolution that meets the needs and demands of a democratic future for Myanmar. People are prepared for a long haul and are willing to put everything on the line to fight this dictatorship. All right, thank you, Jared. I think what emerges from that, your, your description of the, you know, the motivations for the coup is, is just how out of touch the military establishment is with the country that they purport to rule over. Um, now, one dimension which is, you know, uh, you know, attracted a lot of interest, uh, particularly in the United States, is how Myanmar's northern neighbor, China, has viewed the events unfolding in the country. Um, you know, there are some that have said that China's in favor of the coup or even had a hand in it, uh, without much evidence, of course. Um, and there are, you know, um, you know, uh, others that have questioned that narrative and, and, and you know, um, highlighted the fact that this you know, this coup, you know, may not be welcome to the leaders in Beijing. So Yun, could you just take us through, you know, how you view um, or how China likely views the developments that are happening in Myanmar now and what explains its, uh, and, and how in brief the Chinese government has responded to it so far? Well, thank you, Sebastian. Uh, I know that we're limited on time, so I will try to speak as quickly and briefly as possible. I will cover three issues. I will cover China and I will also cover the three, um, three scenarios coming to this coup and how the international community, different actors are, view, uh, are viewing these three scenarios and, uh, and where they stand. First on China, I think a lot of people think that China somehow is a winner of the coup. I do not agree with that assessment. Um, I've been following China Myanmar since 2007. Um, and by no means is China a winner in this coup. China is, uh, is a pretty big loser. So the people who think that China is a winner uh, reaches that conclusion because uh, they think that isolated Myanmar has no choice but to, uh, to rely on, on Myanmar. But there are three problems with this logic. The first one is an isolated Myanmar does not accept everything China dictated or China will dictate. And otherwise, um, for all the economic projects that China has wanted, Myanmar should have given those to, to China during the, military, uh, during the military years before 2011, because that was, of course, Myanmar's most isolated moment. The second problem with the logic is that China has also worked very well with the NLD government. Let's not forget the fact that the CMEC, the China Myanmar Economic Corridor, it was signed due, under the NLD government, not the Benson government. And I think people will vividly remember that during the Benson government, what happened to the Chinese projects. The Misong Dam project was suspended, the uh, Lapidon copper mine and the Seno Myanmar economic, uh, the Seno Myanmar oil and gas pipelines, they were uh, reinvestigated and reviewed and forced to, revise, to be revised. So during the NLD period, China had the support and almost endorsement from Aung San Suu Kyi, and China was able to repair its image and its influence in Myanmar among the uh, Myanmar general public. But uh, during the military government years, China had always appeared in the Burmese narrative as a supporter of the dictators. The third problem with the logic that China somehow is a winner because Myanmar will be isolated and China is the only choice is that the Myanmar that China needs is a relatively normal and stable Myanmar. And there's nothing normal or stable about the military government as we can see. 
So the importance of Myanmar for China economically and strategically does not lie in the country itself or what the country can deliver itself, but instead it's the strategic location and the connectivity, the linkage that Myanmar could provide to Southeast Asia, to South Asia and to the Indian Ocean. So in this sense, if Myanmar turns into the pariah of the international society again, then what Chinese projects can really link to through such a pariah? That's the that's biggest question. So um, at the beginning of 2021, I think the Chinese plan was to pursue the CMEC in collaboration with the NLD, the second term of the NLD government. That was the direction that Xi Jinping has nailed down, has basically confirmed since his visit on Myanmar last year. And the, one of the key components of uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi's visit to Myanmar in January is to confirm that the NLD government is uh, indeed in the um, is indeed willing and eager to pursue the CMEC in during the second term. But at least the three things has changed after the uh, military coup. The first one is um, the investment environment for the Myanmar certainly has deteriorated. And the uncertainty associated with the social condition, with the in internal stability, has increased exponentially. So all foreign investors, including the Chinese, will become more cautious. The second problem for China is that, for the CMEC project, is that if China uses this opportunity to promote and push forward Chinese projects, the first cause that China will have to pay will be on the domestic public opinion in Myanmar. We have seen that how the, the domestic public opinion in Burma has uh, turned against China in the past uh, in the past months. And if any lesson, if China has learned any lesson in the past ten years in Myanmar, the lesson would be do not. Um, do not make the Burmese public opinion your enemy because that's going to affect everything you're trying to implement in the country. And the last negative impact on the Chinese projects by this coup is that if China continue to pursue this investment, it will have to pay significant, significant cost in terms of its foreign policy and its international reputation. So my conclusion is that after this coup, in the next couple of years, the Chinese attitude towards Myanmar in terms of economic cooperation will be extremely cautious instead of radical or promoting fast development. So what is going to happen to the coup and where, do, where does the international community or the international players stand on that? We're basically looking at three scenarios for this coup. The first one is fait accompli. It means that the uh, result of the military coup will be accepted things will develop according to the military's plan and either through either through its own, um, it's the military organized election or the constitutional revision, the military will somehow become uh, legitimate and again, re receive the recognition and legitimacy from the, from the international community. And that's what some people call the Thai model, basically what happened in Thailand after the uh, coup d'etat in 2014. That's the first possibility. Fate accompli. The second possibility is status quo ante. I think that's what most of the Western countries are aiming for, including the United Nations, which is to reverse the coup. Let's reestablish the status quo before the coup and to reestablish re the condition and the state where we were before uh, February, before the 4 a.m. on February 1st. That's what we call the status quo ante. And the third scenario, third possibility is uh, something that I think um, more and more demonstrators and CDM is pursuing, which is the new status quo that outs the military. So that will indicate it requires a revision of constitution per the democratic public opinion and to pursue the complete uh, democratization and use this opportunity, the opportunity post presented by this coup to oust the Burmese military from its national domestic politics. So this is a goal that we hear more and more from the demonstrators and from the CDM. So these are the three scenarios. And the where do where, where does international players stand? I think first of all, most of the Western countries have called for the status quo anti, including uh, UN Special Envoy. We hear Christine calling for the international players not to recognize the, the military government and not to engage the military government in order not to convey any sense of recognition of its legitimacy. And that's, I think, where US, UK, and a lot of European countries are standing, which is uh, we need to reverse the coup and re 
reestablish the uh, status quo ante. The second category, I will call it, the, call, call it the reaction from the regional countries, and there are significantly more moderate. So for example, I think there have been arguments or papers being written about how Japan and India have been relatively moderate in their reaction to the, to the, to the, to the coup. And we're also seeing ASEAN countries um, trying to engage, especially Thailand and Indonesia uh, already trying to engage with Myanmar and try to play a mediation role. And then there's China, which sticks to the non-interference principle. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very um, interesting to observe what are the, if there's going to be any mediation, what is the goal of such a mediation? Because uh, if there's going to be a mediation, the fate of conflict is certainly not something that the majority of the international community will, will accept. But a status quo ante, on the other hand, is not something that as a military will have appetite for. So I think eventually the mediation will be aimed at some sort of political deal and see if there is a possibility for the Burmese military and for the NLD to make a concession to each other in order to have a compromise. Last but not least, um, the US position. US position is very clear. US supports a peaceful demonstration. US condemns the military coup. And so far, the um, policy reactions that we have seen out of Washington is focused on targeted sanctions. So these are not blanket sanctions targeting the whole country or the whole industry, but it's targeted sanctions um, that's, uh, that's aimed at the people who are responsible for the, uh, for the coup and also responsible for the bloodshed on the street. But the future development of the policy will depend on two, uh, two factors. The first one is uh, the development domestically in Myanmar. So for example, if the violence continues to deteriorate, it will be very difficult to imagine that the US will not escalate its response. And at the same time, the domestic development is also going to affect how the international community will react. So for example, what United Nations Security Council will do in terms of the escalating violence in, in Myanmar. So far, we have a UN Security Council statement, but future statements and actions by UN Security Council are expected if the situation continues to deteriorate. So I don't think US will be missing from that picture either. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Look forward to the discussion. All right. Thanks, Yuan. Um, yeah, I think that really does you know, bring across how challenging this turn of events is and will be for uh, outside governments, especially those who are opposed to the military takeover. Um, in light of time, I might move straight into um, our Q&A session. I, I, the, the first question, I think, um, which we received by email ahead of the event, um, I think perhaps a best um, taken by Tintin Yeo. And this question refers to what lessons can be learned for, for Myanmar civil society and Myanmar activists um, of the past five years of NLD involvement in government. I think Aung San Suu Kyi and the NLD made a, a strategic decision to engage with the military's structures, to work within the constitution, and to, in, in, you know, in many ways, accept the military's rules of the game with the aim of trying to change those rules um, once they're in government. You know, the coup seems to have suggested that that strategy has failed, but I wondered, you know, if you could you know, tell us, do you agree? Has that strategy failed? And if so, you know, um, what you think the way forward is for pro-democracy forces within Myanmar? Thank you for raising this uh, question. This is also the question that is uh, not just a question, this kind of issue that we have been discussing among ourselves too. Uh, and also like um, we can see some of the differing uh, approaches and demands uh, for the country future. It is also a lot based on the, uh, how to say, the action of the Aung San Suu Kyi-led um, government for the previous five years. Because like um, when an LD-led government came into power, many of the uh, pro-democracy groups, including many civil society organizations, those have been working along the borders uh, for so many years for the um, for demo democratization in the country uh, have how do you say um, many frustration frustration against um, NLD government for the past five years because one thing they very much lack is they do not engage enough with the civil society organizations and then the pro-democracy groups instead 
they uh, very much engaged with the Demodor, the Burma army. So, but it didn't really also like, uh, uh, how do you say, explain uh, that they are trying to uh, engage with the Demodor. It is just part of the strategy to reconcile, to make some reconciliation uh, in order to, how do you say, um, uh, persuade or convince the army, the Burma army, to act like, um, how do you say, um, the army that is protecting the people. I don't know, we don't know, uh, how do you say, the real intentions of the Dong San Suu Kyi in that regard. But um, for us, and also for many groups who has been under the military dictatorship, always uh, kept saying that based on the military Burma army action as well, responses, we know that these groups are very rigid and also they are trying to, they, they were always trying to hold their power and they were never compromised. So we, even like an ordinary activist know that, but why do Aung San Suu Kyi have higher expectation when it's come to the Burma army. So that like, um, um, so that's also simply, uh, how do you say, we are facing some of the, how do you say, an unwanted result uh, when it's come to like, uh, you know, um, uh, our fight for military dictatorship now. Uh, that's why um, I think Yunson also explained there are three scenarios. It came out like a three, uh, I would like to explain the last two scenarios, why uh, it's, it's related to this question as well. You know, the, the first one is like, uh, not just, you know, the international communities, there are also some, uh, there are also people, including NLD and NLD follower. They would like to choose the second scenarios to, re to return back to the situation before February 1st. And there are also like um, half of the population I mean, like uh, the, especially different ethnic nationalities, they would like to choose the third scenarios, which is to completely abolish the military dictatorship and then to completely abolish uh, 2008 constitution and then to come up with a new constitution that guarantee federal democracy in the country, that guarantee uh, the individual uh, rights as well as the collective rights. So that, that is what um, half of the population demanded. So we can see there are some division, but right now what we are trying to, and say convince the people that, okay, let's first aim to, the to get rid of the military uh, coup. And then it will come to the other process because we cannot get everything at once. And also we cannot ignore the result of the 2020, uh, 2020 election, which we can clearly uh, see that NLD win a majority. More or less, there can be some of the fraud or some of the like a uh, miscalculation, but it is not like uh, what the military uh, region are saying. So uh, we know that NLD has been still very popular. The uncertainty popularity is still enormous. So that like, um, and um, so uh, I think we cannot uh, go to the third scenario at once. Uh, but the second scenario, probably if we can get rid of the, uh, the military regime, we may arrive, we may reach uh, back to the second scenario, which is, you know, to, uh, to the stage where we, before the coup happened. And then, but, uh, but our, uh, you know, most of the, protester in this time saying that we cannot stop after, you know, we go back to, you know, the, uh, how to say, uh, go back to the situation before the February, because we have to keep fighting. Because our now, uh, almost our aims is to completely get rid of the military regime. So that means that we can not tolerate any components that the military, uh, that the current Burma army fit in. So they shouldn't be in anywhere. So that means that then what is we, what are we going to do with the army? That can be the question. But for us, it's like uh, maybe the, you know, the expertise uh, uh, can, can say uh, better. But for me, it's as like um, a citizens of Burma, as activists, you know, if all the top military leaders are removed or taken action, then 
you know, the soldiers below in the army can be controlled. So we don't need to remove every, everything. You know, only the top military leader, leaders need to be removed. So, um, but uh, for, uh, we, can, we have to really, uh, how do you say, um, come up with some strategies uh, and then to try to also, uh, how do you say, uh, make, uh, how do you say, to try to talk to every groups, those are involved in the current fight against the military coup, to understand the the, re, uh, the how to say um, how to, uh, what is going to happen if the military coup is uh, is completely destroyed, or if they do not destroy, if they continue to win, you know this fight, then what are we going to do? So we have been discussing some, but but um, not as a whole yet. So we, we are taking some action, but the problem is like, um, we cannot also expect that our situation, uh, we can just return back to Thailand or return to Bangladesh or return to India, and then just continue our struggle like before 2010. We cannot do that also. You know, Thailand is not, the, especially Thailand where all the pro-democracy group used to be together, but Thailand also changed. And although they have like a, a democratically elected government, but that came from the honestly, uh, military coup as well. So I mean, like, um, for if we don't uh, if we don't win in this current fight, I, I mean, like, we cannot just simply uh, go to the border country, uh, you know, the neighboring countries, and continue our struggle. That's why every one of us are saying that this is our last fight, and we fight until we win. If we don't win, we all well, sacrifice. So that is what Generation Z has been also declaring. So that's why either they win or either we win. You know, there is no, we, we, we cannot lose. So that is, this is our last fight. Yeah. Can I just jump in there and, and just just um, uh, build on Tintin Yo's point? Of course. Uh, just about the military and, and it's sort of the question of, of where the military goes in a post-coup landscape. Um, and just just make the point that you know the military is not disappearing. It's not going anywhere as an institution uh, uh, in a variety of different ways. It's the best armed organization and you know arguably the best organized organization in the country. But it is also not a monolithic entity where everyone uh, has exactly the same interests, where everyone gets along uh, and where everyone, acts and in lockstep and sees things the same way. Um, the reality is that this is an ill-judged and reckless uh, power grab um, by those at the very top rank of the military that are meant to be retiring. Uh, and there are many others in the military who would be judging daily the cost of this move, of seizing power, of, of threatening the entire roadmap to discipline flourishing democracy, the cost to the army's reputation as a uh, you know, national institution that genuinely you know, serves the people, which some in the military have been trying to kind of move the entire door towards in recent years. Um, but they'll also be seeing the costs to military companies like uh, Myanmar Economic Holdings Limited, and Myanmar um, and MEC, Myanmar Economic Corporation, that this coup brings to all of the business ent entities of the Myanmar military, which again, mostly senior leaders and high ranking uh, mem members of the Tatmadaw own shares in MEHL, for example, but they will also be seeing the costs to their own businesses, uh, their family businesses, the businesses of their children, as a consequence of this coup not just because people will be boycotting those businesses, as we've seen a widespread boycott uh, on the ground in Myanmar of all military businesses and military affiliated uh, uh, businesses, um, but also because of dictatorship decimating business. You know, bad decisions by small groups of people acting in their own self-interest in many cases, destroy businesses and de just destroy livelihoods. And there will just be bad decisions taken by this little clique of people who've been admitted to the you know, State Administrative Council, which will destroy businesses of everyone, but also military families. And I think as we go along, as the, the, the uprisings and crackdown cycles continue and, and continue to carry on, it becomes clear as Tintin Yo has said, that people are not, they see this as the final fight. 
They've, they've had to deal and contend with dictatorships throughout much of the 20th century since independence. And they're not going to see the 21st century slide into the same uh, morass of autocratic uh, dictatorship. And so people in the military will be judging this daily. And, you know, these kinds of little waves of defections that we've been seeing in recent days and in weeks, whispers to the many, many people who may not be there yet, but that, that there may come a time in the military when others realise that actually the future doesn't lie in a, 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 a men online dictatorship. It lies in the military, perhaps putting him and his family on a plane to Russia or somewhere else uh, and disappearing them and uh, you know, trying to negotiate with protesters and with the parliament, uh, the parliamentary, uh, the CRPH. Uh, and I think that's, you know, we have to remember the military is not going anywhere, but it's also not a monolithic entity. Yes, thank you, Jared. And, and, and Tintinio, I think that this, it really does highlight the extent to which this current moment is a moment of extreme danger, but also of a certain amount of political potential, given the determination of so many people to, to not just push for the reversal of the coup, but also to push for deeper reforms that, um, you know, that, that, that neutralize the military's political role. Um, um, I've, th for the next question, I've got one for Yun Sun um, from Alex Jeffrey. Um, and he asks, in a scenario in which the situation deteriorates further and violence increases, perhaps something along the lines of 2007 or even 1988, um, what does an American escalation of response look like beyond targeted sanctions, uh, you know, sanctions targeted at key generals and members of the Tatmadaw? Well, we have seen what U.S. blanket sanctions on Myanmar looks like before 2011. And a lot of those sanctions were not dropped until the NLD came into power in 2016. So I think in terms of the international isolation that the US will be able to impose on the country and not just on the military, we have seen what it would look like. And that is a pretty long SDN list and also comprehensive sanctions on different industries and different trades that's under the control of the, of the Burmese government. So I think that is a very likely direction that we will be going into if this military coup does not get resolved in the end. Thank you. Okay, yeah, um, and I might just, you know, um, we're getting towards the end, but I, I've had a, we've had a couple of questions about the potential role of, you know, ethnic armed organizations, ethnic minority political groups and civil society groups in the, um, you know, the the, the struggle um, against this dictatorship, and also the the deeper question of uh, of, of ethnic inclusion in Myanmar and building a multi ethnic federal democracy that you know, that incorporates the and respects the rights and interests of these individuals. I was wondering if maybe um, Tintin Yeo offers some thoughts on that and then and then perhaps if, if you know Jared wants to jump in after that, um, they can do so. Thank you. So there's two parts that I would like to um, discuss. One is like uh, the, the, uh, the involvement of the, the different ethnic groups in this um, movement against the military coup. And the second is the role of the EEO, the ethnic armed organizations. <laughs> So um, at the um, protest on street started on the 6th of February, just two days after the protest that happened on the main main township like Yango and Nipido, Mandalay, all different uh, part of the state's region joined the mass protest against the military coup. More and more different ethnic groups even they are staying in like a very remote area, they even join. They even like a, uh, organize the protest against military coup. Because uh, one of the like a very uh, simple ways of organizing and also having this a, a very, very large and millions of millions of mass protests happen because all the different ethnic people know so well how they were treated by the Burma army for so many years, many centuries. So that's why um, under the name of abolishing, completely abolishing the military regime, they all join. So that means that uh, Burman or, or other ethnic groups, all different religions, they all are at one site against the military coup, a complete uh, abolishment of the dictatorship in the country. So that, 
there, there are, we can see that like now half of the population are already uh, in, the, in the protest. So uh, in the protest against the military regime. And then, yeah, of course the demand is a little bit di different, but we can see that uh, more and more people are start talking about, uh, you know, federal democracy, toward federal democracy. Yeah, uh, not just abolish, not just you know, uh, going back to the uh, the, the two thousand twenty era. So, um, but for the ethnic armed organizations, uh, I think like uh, they come up with some strong statements. For example, there are the uh, signatory groups as uh, the groups those sign the NCA, the Nationwide Ceasefire Agreement. There are time groups. Uh, so they come out with a statement, the last statement, quite strong, uh, but because they said that they are going to stop engaging with the current, um, uh, uh, how do you say, the, the newly formed uh, peace committee under the military council. But, but there is one problem, they said, they said that temporarily. So temporarily means how long, we don't know, when they are going to resume the talks, or when are they going to accept the talk with the um, the peace committee and the military council? And then uh, one of the like, um, if we have to talk on behalf of the like uh, the ordinary people, we are not satisfied by seeing that the Northern Alliance groups, which used to be very strong and fierce in fighting against the Baba army, become very quiet. When, when the coup happened. So um, we have to uh, let's say, know why. Uh, simply one thing is like, um, I think maybe Johnson also can explain because that's also Northern Alliance groups are pretty much um, operated in the borders of China. And, I, and then people has been saying that they are also uh, kind of controlled uh, by the Chinese government. And also because of the, their geographical location and where they located, they cannot do what they want to do. So that's one thing that people have been to say, um, saying. But I, I, uh, for us, it's like as it is in, we would like to see this is the time, you know, all the people are sacrificing without arms. They are already sacrificing their lives in the fight against for the military coup and the total, uh, you know, uh, how do you say this um, dictatorship. They are removing the dictatorship, uh, the system. Yeah, uh, that is. This is the time that the ethnic armed groups should take the the role in supporting the people. So that is what we we would like to see, but we don't know what are the constraints and what are the how to say risks they are having for staying silent. But uh, if for this struggle, it seems like um, you know an armed civilian civilians are fighting against the people who have uh, all kinds of guns and all kinds of like, um, you know, um, uh, things that they have to kill the people. So without other support, no matter how, how many millions people join in the protest, more or less gradually, they will be taken down. I mean, because they have no arms. But if, if people become like uh, out of their tolerance and they, if they become like aggressive, that means that it is so easy for the military army to control again. So that's why we are trying to talk within ourselves to use all nonviolent strategy. Although we know that there's so many lives has been killed. So many has been taken into detention and so many are disappearing. But we still have to encourage to each other that, that don't do any violence. But this time people kept saying that we can't tolerate anymore because they are killing us, they are beating us, and we just have to run away. Or oh, that is not, you know, this is not what we, uh, that is not how we can win. So that people people start, you know, showing their, how to say, uh, their resistance. Uh, and then now it's nonviolence, but we don't know how long they are going to hold their angers. So that's also one of the, like a worry that we have but we, uh, one of the things is like, um, there are some of the strike uh, committee, you know, general strike committee, general strike committee for ethnic nationalities. So hopefully these groups are going to, how to say, control the mass 
demonstrators and also like a CIPH. And it seems like CIPH is taking some action and they are, act, they are acting more and more like a, you know, interior government. So that is what also, you know, in this time, it is important that, you know, there are groups who are also in parallel, of course, with the military uh, coup, that they are also acting. And then one of the, how to say, um, encouraging for us is like, we got a quite, a, we got a strong international support in terms of sympathizing and also condemning Although there is no, no other action yet, but uh, still, you know, all the international communities, many countries uh, are standing with the people uh, in the fight for military coup. So that is one of the, how to say, empowering side that we are getting. Aside from, you know, um, we, we, because we are fighting this struggle uh, with, without anything, only with our will, commitment and determination. So uh, in order to win this, we really need other, other support. And also I think like uh, uh, this is the time that we really need to strategize where we are going to move forward most, most strategically, most systematically, and then with a common, common how say, understanding. So this is the time that we really have to come up with that. Um, thank you, Sebastian. Can I just add, add something? I need to run, but I would like to say sure. something about this question. I think the, the, the first one is when the ethnic groups look at this coup and look at demonstrations that's happening, at least for the EAOs, a lot of them see this as an inter-Burman inter problem. That whether it is a military, whether it is a military, whether it is an LD, these are the majority Burma, Burma group. It's, it, it has very little to do with, uh, with the EAOs, right? And when they look at the result of the 2020 election, the ethnic political parties had hoped to gain more seats, at least on their, on their lo local ludos. But the reality, we also saw that the, uh, the, the, the FOPO electoral system is not necessarily working in the ethnic party's favor. So coming to what the military has proposed in terms of changing the electoral system to a proportional representation is actually quite popular. Among the, pop, among the ethnic political parties, because that will give them more voices within the national politics as well. And coming to the, um, I think the, the ethnic's reaction to the coup, we need to distinguish the EAOs, the political organizations of the ethnic groups and the, the ethnic population. So if you go to Shan State, if you go to Kachin State, you will see that ethnic people are angry about the coup and they are also demonstrating a, on the street. But I think the EAOs have a completely different set of political calculations. If we think about the history, when was the ceasefire actually possible or implemented in the history? It was when the military was in charge because they did not want to upset the, the power balance. And it is exactly during this power transition period that power is up for grab. And that's when the, uh, for example, the Kachin conflict really, really broke up. So I almost want to say that once the military takes well, say this hypothetically, if the first scenario um, prevails and there is going to be a fait accompli and we have another military government in Myanmar for the foreseeable future, then I think the EAOs will use that opportunity to reach another ceasefire agreement, maybe bilateral or maybe multilateral agreement with the military government. And we're gonna see the div divided st state of Myanmar continue into, uh, into the future. But, um, yeah, so I'm not, I'm not terribly positive about the ethnic friend development, but I have to go. Thank you so much, Sebastian, and thank you for, for the opportunity to be here. Um, and I look forward to your next discussion. Thank you. Thank you, yes. And I, I think I, I will probably take the opportunity then to wind things up. Um, thank you to our three panelists, um, uh, especially for Tintin Yo coming in just at the last minute to join us. Um, uh, and, you know, please, as I mentioned before, you can access our new diplomat risk intelligence report on Myanmar at dri.thediplomat.com. Um, otherwise, keep, keep tuned on our website. This will be posted as a, a YouTube video on our website, which we will share out on our social media platforms, which you can, of course, pass on, especially to colleagues within Myanmar who weren't able to tune in. Um, Otherwise, um, you know, thank, thank you for all, all attending and um, you know, I look forward to seeing you here again in future. Thank you, Sebastian.